Shelly Stahl is the Director of Data Programs at AGU. She's worked with organizations in the not-for-profit, commercial, defense, and federal civilian communities, working on data her pretty much her entire career. She is the data person on data management, metadata management, organizational change management. Manage it, that's what she does. Shelly's first metadata moment was, I, I hope I'm not being too, I'm sh not sharing too much. Well. It was, it was very special. It was at the ripe young age of 11. She started a repository. I don't know what she did at age 12. If at age 11 you start a repository, what's next? Okay, okay. so that's what my talk's about, is the repository. Um, so first of all, the, uh, thank you so much. I work for the American Geophysical Union, and the beginning of this talk is by special request from Ginny Hendricks, so I just want you to know this was a demanded talk. Um, and I'll move very quickly into the work that we're doing on the Enabling Fair Data Project. So um, here you see, uh, has anyone taken a vacation in a recreational vehicle? Okay, all right, good, all right. So these are not big vehicles. Um, and what you can see in 1978, so this is before the Atari 800 hit, uh, was able to be sold uh, as, as one of the very first personal computers. So my, my dad took a sabbatical and um, we went around the United States and he was doing research on, on educational methods in different state, uh, state systems. And so there's two adults, two kids, 29 states, one broken toilet, one broken fridge. Follow me, we're gonna go quickly. So um, to, in order to tell all of my friends what an amazing trip I had, so I'm 11, right? Uh, I got a scrapbook from my mother. And so here's what I did. And I want you to understand how important this taxonomy is. First of all, I was tracking things that were neat, neat things. Then things and objects and charms. This is incredibly accurate taxonomy. Do you not agree with me? Um, so we headed, so I lived in Pennsylvania, we headed down the East Coast, um, and we're, we went to the Atomic Energy folks, um, uh, Ruby Falls and Rock City, and head to Stone Mountain, and Okie Finoki Swamp, um, really was disgusting. So there were alligators, and yes, that's a picture of me, my brother and my mom, dad of course held the camera, very few pictures of him. Um, so this was gross, this was absolutely disgusting, and I couldn't wait to leave. Um, so my trip, not so good so far. Uh, however, I did like taking samples, so physical samples, um, and I made sure that they were incredibly accurate in their metadata such that um, any sand from St. Augustine Beach, Florida would replicate the sample exactly, right, right, the, not a GIS, right, we had no cell back then, um, so you could go to St. Augustine, Florida and capture a sample that was just like mine and get a, a little um, seashell as well. And the other one is from Pacific Ocean, um, and mind you, um, I was really clear that it was the Pacific Ocean so that you could replicate this sample as well and make sure that you're at a rest stop because you'll be more accurate. Um, so we headed to Carlsbad Cavern where I did a very quantitative research analysis on the number of bats that I saw, a million, and I swear to you it was a million, counted really fast. Um, and uh, then make sure when you're, when you're documenting um, things within your, your repository, your journal, your scrapbook, that you're clear on whatever weather anomaly might affect the work that you're doing. So you can see here that there was a big dust storm and you know it's big because I use really big letters to identify that. Um, so heading to White Sands, okay, I really liked White Sands. Again, we have a sand sample here, um, and here are my brother and I pretending that we're survivors, but I really did like White Sands. So in my scrapbook, I was really clear to make a lot of observations and drawings. So even days that were boring, um, so today was not exciting, uh, and things that I wanted to remember for later, like where I would like to go on my honeymoon, I don't think Willie G still exists, um, and important uh, operational techniques such as dumping the sewage, and the days that we did that, really important, and sorry Tallahassee, really crummy lunch in Tallahassee. Um, but important field, note, uh, when, field notes when you're making them, you're doing uh, drawings to better articulate what you're seeing, I think you would all agree that this is a very accurate depiction of Mount Rainier, because I have identified there that it is a big mountain. Yep. 
Um, so lots of pictures here for the very large array. Um, did I mention my dad was an earth scientist and he taught in high school? So we tended to spend more time on things he thought was cool. And you could tell that by the number of slides that he took. This was a, a lot of slides. Um, and I think it was mostly an empty page and the PS was, yeah, we saw those radio telescopes. Um, so this was cool. So remember this trip is in 1978. 1977, uh, Close Encounters with a Third Kind had just come out. Um, has anyone seen? Okay, enough. The rest of you, please see. Um, so it, w the highlight of this was Devil's Tower. And of course we had to go there. And there's my brother, clearly not in a safe place. Um, and he did become a, uh, a professional geologist. Um, so anyway, we get back home and things are great. Um, and what I'd like to tell you, um, and, and many thanks to the folks here that might represent the National Park Service or the Bureau of Land Management, um, this, this, we spent a lot of time there, frankly, because it's a really cheap place to go. Um, and they just had their 100th anniversary, and thanks for that. But I want to tell you about the data management that we, uh, that we did during this trip. So first of all, did we plan our repository? Well, yes, we did. Um, this, all of the data was kept in a central location, the scrapbook, which was located on above where my bed was, which was above the cab in that cute little fun place that only an 11-year-old could get, get into. Um, and I just want you to know that this repository was fully funded throughout my entire life. So, right? Unusual. So this, so I'm pretty old. Um, and yes, fully funded repository. So following the plan, so it was very meticulous and clear and timely and descriptive. That was important. I did quality checks. Not every day did I get the date right, so I had to fix it. And, and you've used rubber cement, right? So everything was put in with rubber cement, which is always fun. Um, and accurate identification. We've talked about how unique and persistent and very accurate I was. I know you're proud of me. Um, and then the fact that we, uh, we went around the United States, this was a three month trip. Lots of uh, improvements were made and highlighting the fact that in Las Vegas, uh, during the middle of summer, dad fixed the broken toilet and that was really awful. Um, and then the broken fridge was fixed in San Francisco, which took a couple weeks to wait for that part to show up. So, um, the moral of the story here, and, and I will transition into fair data in one moment, but this you're going to really love. So a year later, after the sabbatical was over, um, dad had submitted his tax returns to the IRS and he was audited. Now keep in mind, this was a sabbatical for his own research and he was claiming the fuel costs. That RV really guzzled gasoline. Um, so what they asked for, yeah. This is frightening. So what they asked for was um, proof of the mileage, right? So how far was it from each place? Um, and exactly where you stayed so each destination could be determined. And the question was, gee, Dad, did you keep track of that? Well, no, he did not. So um, hold on. We've got brilliance. Every day, she wrote down where we were. So we have a really great superhero story with data. And Jeannie, I hope you're happy. <laughs> uh, so moral of the story, it's, it's not too early to practice good data management skills. So let me segue from then, and we roll forward 40 years. So the RV was called the Open Road, open, not lost on me. Open Road to the Open and Fair Data, where we're moving forward with findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And now I work with a bunch of scientists worldwide, 300,000, mind you. Um, and have you heard about FAIR? Okay, not everybody lifted their hand, so we're going to take a second. So um, there's a publication in Nature, and I have in these slides uh, a link to it, or a, a, the definition for it, DOI specifically. Um, and at the, the preamble has these words here having to do with the need to reuse, the reuse of scholarly data. We don't have the infrastructure. And, and Jennifer and Tricia just talked about the fact that data citation is really tough um, and being able to make that happen is really important and it really starts where the journal's requiring it. So this is, um, this is the project that we're working on for enabling fair data. So why are we doing this? So the American Geophysical Unit has cared about data for quite a long time. They've had a position statement on data that affirms it's a world heritage, especially within our space. 
the tsunami, the fires that are happening in California right now, these horrible things that, that are there are um, not recreatable and you need to have the observations stored so we can understand better about climate change, we can understand better about saving lives. Um, and that's incredibly valuable, that data needs to be preserved. And importantly for this meeting, the credit has to be there. It's important for our researchers to realize how important those data, those data products are. So what are we doing? Um, that we're taking the fair guiding principles and we're working through this concept of findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And here's your DOI. Um, and thank you, Nature, for publishing. And thank you to the writers who were internationally um, uh, convened to do this. Um, and we've called the project Enabling Fair Data. Uh, the Laura and John Arnold Foundation uh, have provided us with the funds for doing this, and it builds on funds already provided by the National Science Foundation and Sloan for um, efforts on the Coalition on Publishing Data and the Earth and Space Sciences. Okay, get me again. Coalition on Publishing Data in the Earth and Space Sciences. And the reason that matters is the acronym is the website, COP. DESS.org. Go there because I'm going to send you there in a minute. COPDESS.org. Got it. Okay. So they funded us to be able to create implementation guidelines for all the publishers and all the repositories. And yeah, we're starting with the Earth and Space Sciences, but it's tough to do it without bringing you all with us. So come along. Here are the two objectives, so the elevator speech. So for the data repositories, we are asking, please support data citation. Help the researchers make sure that their data is well documented. You have a landing page. There's a persistent identifier that's globally resolvable. One we prefer is a DOI, but we'll take any of them because there's a lot out there. Um, and work with the researchers to make sure the metadata is in good shape. And then the publishers have a big lift, and Tricia was talked about it earlier, um, making sure that you are following cross-refs, data citation schema with both references and relationships. Make sure that that data is properly coded so the automated attribution for your data citation happens. Yes! Okay, this is where you get super excited. And if I were talking about the Roar community, you would? Okay, so make sure you're properly coding your data citations. Roar? Oh, okay, it's way more exciting than that. Um, and you implementing, you publishers are implementing common author guidelines for data such that, wait for it, such that every researcher has the same expectation no matter which journal they go to on what to do with their data. Miracle? Yeah, and it happened, and it's happening right now, and the implementation is taking place. Data not in a supplement, data in a repository, data citation linking to the repository, all the beautiful linking taking place. Very nice. All right, so these were the folks we partnered with at the beginning. In the end, we had well over 300 entities that worked with us. So we've got Nature and Science and Elsevier and PLOS and Endowi and Copernicus and Wiley and of course the Proceedings of the National Academy and of course the AGU. Taylor and Francis was also helping us as well. Uh, let's see, who else? Uh, and Ubiquity as well. Um, those were folks that came a little, just a little bit hair, a hair later. And of course we had data site in their uh, alliance and partnership and um, close companionship with RE3 data um, and ORCID and Crossref and Chorus and Scholix and onward and onward. Um, so the ecosystem, you know this is, can, this is very complex. To make a cultural change, every single person listed in this ecosystem has to participate and support and move forward. Probability for major cultural change is low, right? But we're gonna do this. We are making this happen right now. The publishers and the repositories are moving forward. We're not solving all the problems and we're gonna need your help to continue to solve problems. Um, uh, okay, copdess.org, here you are. Click on Enabling Fair Data. There are three things on this website I want you to look at in detail, and none of them are very long, so you can do that while you're eating lunch. One is our commitment statement. Read it, especially the bullets that apply to you as a stakeholder. I'm very interested that you have a chance to take a look, because if you're trying to do something like this in your own organization, this will actually get you pretty far along to where you need to be, and you're welcome to take and use and copy and whatever. Um, and you can also be a signatory. There's a button to be a signatory. Please do that if you feel so uh, inclined. Also, the FAQs. 
Um, the commitment statement is in stone. The FAQs help to interpret exactly how it's implemented, and we can continue to update that as new technology comes along. And all 300 stakeholders agreed on the answers. I mean, crazy, right? So it's really awesome. And then the other thing that's in here are author guidelines. Um, and I'm going to show this to you in a second, but you, I want you to look at those as well. So here are the bullets for a researcher, OK? So a researcher signing on to the commitment statement saying, I want to have my data as open and fair. What do I do? So can you tell there's blue there? Yes? Roar. OK, can you tell there's blue there? OK, good. Um, so what that means is this, um, the relationship a researcher has with their repository allows them to actually do the blue part. So researchers that don't have relationships, and you know where I'm going, the, the repository finder tool, right? Um, they need to be able to find these, these repositories. So um, making sure the metadata is there, and we are encouraging software citation as well, by the way. Um, persistent identifiers, and that there's clear licensing for reuse for that data and or software. Um, that they're actually doing the citations for all of the different kinds of research products, requiring data, recommending the rest, um, and that they have data availability statements. We still need those. Um, and that they're actually using and actively working with their data management plans, which holds us all together. Remember the scrapbook, the data management plan? See how that connects? Um, so here's the author guidelines. I'm going to let you read them because they're, this is fairly dense. But it, essentially, the guidance that we gave um, all, of the author, all of the publishers is you don't have to put these verbatim into your online author guidelines. But what we want you to do is work in the text that we have very meticulously put together and the, um, that you're actually inferring and um, uh, the same level of requirement that we had intended. Uh, not inferring, but you are requiring the same level uh, of mandatory that we've intended. Um, so here's the, the same picture that um, Trisha just showed you for the repository finder tool. This has been really useful. It's a, a first go at it, so if you have any comments, we're happy to work them into the design. Um, and the next steps are get more signatures uh, and engage with folks that are working with researchers so they can help them with this culture change. Uh, let folks know that there's a repository finder tool out there and that we did our public announcement on this last week. Um, here are the three things um, that I also tweeted out, by the way. So if you look on Twitter, Shelly Stahl, S-H-E-L-L-E-Y-S-T-A-L, -L -E um, you will find, um, or CR Live 18, maybe easier, um, the publication within Science Editor that gives the information about what editors need to know for their authors, the article within EOS that talks about the project in general, which is kind of fun. There's a lot of people involved. Um, and then the three things within Coptis that I want you to take a look at and be a signatory. You are very welcome for that. That is a massive, massive coordination project. Um, thank you, Shelley. We have time for just one question. Are there any? If you could tell me how you managed to bring together all of the journals of the entire domain, uh, so I would love to know. It, uh, oddly, it was easy. Um, so there had been that pre-work for COPTAS. So the journals had already engaged. Um, so that included um, uh, Nature and Science, the Proceedings of the National Academies, Elsevier, and PLOS, and all the ones that I listed. They, they already knew that data had to be handled better. Mm -hmm. um, what was missing, uh, and that had a, a commitment statement as well. Um, what was missing was a common set of guidelines for how to implement uh, what that meant. Um, and really, it was a little too early. Research Data Alliance, Force 11, and the Earth Science Information Partners, uh, which is an entity um, primarily based in the US, they had been working on um, each of the elements for implementation. And oddly, right as we were asking for money from the Arnold Foundation, all of those elements were coming up for completeness, had been vetted in an international community. So we got the um, uh, nickname as a green project. We didn't build anything new. We adopted from everywhere else. Um, so it was, it was good. That is a very good lesson to learn. Thank you so much, Shelley.